mother was a widow and she brought three three of us up. I've got two brothers, they're both dead now, of course, but Alan and Lionel um, in Boston in Lincolnshire, uh, not far from the railway station, uh, where the bus station is at the top of James Street, which is where I was living. Um, the um, A bomber flew over, or a fighter, fighter bomber, German, flew over in the war, and they reckon he spotted a, a glimmer of light coming from the... Uh, one of the steam engines that's supposed to have been sheeted up but it must have flashed a light out and he was being chased I think by fighters so he decided to unload his bomb and he dropped it and it hit the top of James Street which is now the bus station and it blew out all the, the top end of it and it never got it was their dump, bomb dump as we called it for many years until they rebuilt it and it's now a bus station. As a kid, you saying you used to play on what did you call it? On the bomb dump, yeah, with wrecked houses and pits and all the rest of it. Like it was years before they got it built on. They ain't got any money, I suppose. But um, yeah, well, I, I wanted to go on the railway because my brother was a fireman on the railways, and he said, well, usually you had a job to get on the railways, but if you had a relative on there, which he was, of course, he said I can probably get you on. So I put my name down and went to work in a box factory, making box boxes out of uh, timber and so on, for six months until I got the call up to go on the railways and started as a cleaner. Uh, now I was 17 then. I, I went to uh, Peterborough on, on loan as a fireman and, um, as I say, the, uh, the mallard stood on the pit because it was working then and uh, had its fire cleaned and cold up and all the rest of it, stood ready to move off and I asked the driver, my driver I was with, could I actually move the mallard? And he said, well, be careful with it, but yeah, go on, go steady then. And so I got on and, uh, as I say, took the handbrake off, dropped the steam, steam engine handle off and wound her into gear and chuffed it off, chug, 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 and... Uh, I was actually driving the fastest steam engine in the world, only for about 200 yards, but at least I'd driven it, which uh, I was quite pleased about that. And then from there, because I know... Well, you work up from cleaner to past cleaner, which is spare fireman and uh, fireman, but there was no vacancies then, of course. Prescription, prescription, conscription was calling at 18, about 18 and a half actually when I went in. So I worked through uh, on the railways until then, and uh, off we went. Joined the Royal Lincolnshire Regiment. Um, I always remember that um, um, I'm a, a bit like um, Andrea's a bit waffy. Was it? We call her a bit waffy, you know. And I think she takes after me. Anyway, it was laid out in PE. PTI was there. Right, I did, 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 right. All everybody on the side, left, left arm and right arm lift. For some strange reason, I was facing everybody else. <laughs> hey, you, he said. He walked over to me, he said, you're facing the whole fucking way, he said. Get it right next time, all right? Right. About turn, face over at the other side, because <laughs> I turned over and I was still facing them. <laughs> and he picked a bucket, a fire bucket full of water, and threw it all over me. Now clean that mess up, he said. Oh, God. <laughs> Just a memory, you know. <laughs> Just funny the way I turned over. I'm out thinking if I stay with him, I'll be all right. But no, I turned over. And of course, yeah, you, know, you do feel an idiot, <laughs> which they don't mind at all. Now they've got to knock it out of you and bring it. Well, it's supposed to be bring you down to the same level, so you can train you. What we didn't always work that way, but that's what they like. That sort of thing. Uh, well, we did training at Sir Brian Barrett's in Lincoln um, for about. So about 11 or 12 weeks, I think it was, something like that. And then we went to Colchester. We're in the battalion, the Lincolnshire Regiment Battalion was going abroad. So we sailed from uh, Plymouth, I think it was, uh, to, to Malaya. It took us about six weeks, I think it was, quite a while. Um, through the uh, uh, Suez Canal, which had been... Uh, uh, on the way, on the way back, I'm jumping a bit now, but we couldn't get back through the Suez because they blocked it. NASA had uh, sunk some ships in it, so we had to fly back. But that's, that's another bit of the story.
we finished up going to Singapore, I think it was, landing in Singapore, and did, did a little bit of jungle training in Singapore, just off Singapore, and then on to Malaya itself, where we uh, took up our duties and learned how to patrol and hunt the, the communist terrorists, CTs we call them, communist terrorists. And a lot of people don't know the story of what, what were we doing in Malaya, <clears throat> but it seems that when the Japanese took over Malaya from the Brits and um, the communist terrorists was fi fighting in the jungle against the Japanese and they said, look, we'll, we'll fight on your side. You know, you give us the weapons and we'll, we'll fight the Japs, which we did. And of course, once the, the war was over, the communist terrorists said, right, now we want to take Malaya over. And that's where the British troops went, went in to get to, to sort the problem out, as always, right? Send the Brits in. And that's what we were doing. We were patrolling the jungle looking for these communist terrorists who had quite a, a reign, killing people if they didn't do as they were told and so on. But we, we sorted them out anyway. Oh, part of the... <laughs> part of a platoon. There's three platoons in the company. <clears throat> we was 12 company. And they called... On our first expedition out, there was a thunderstorm and um, lightning struck a tree and split it right down. We thought somebody was throwing a grenade at us, but it wasn't. It was just this uh, lightning strike. So we called ourselves the Thunderbolts, and that was 12 platoon was called the Thunderbolts. Yeah, and um, that's it. We patrolled and found what we could. Hopefully, nothing, but we did run into trouble and bits and bobs. Yeah, it was quite a. Yeah, it was so different, you know, and uh, wild and. Um, exotic if you like but it was humid very sweaty and hard work because all, all in your jungle gear and as soon as you put it on and got out the lorry and started marching you was wet through in in sweat and you was like that all day long that was that's one of my memories of the jungle was you used to get camp up by a stream you found a stream for drinking water and washing and you take all your wet all your wet clothes, usually by then they were wet as well as sweaty, wet through with rain or whatever. It's, you take them off, put, you carry a dry set with you and you chain, put your dry set on and put your hammock up and sleep for the night. Then in the morning you got up and you put your wet socks on, your wet trousers, your wet underpants and your wet jacket, all cold. It wasn't warm, it was cold wet. And I still remember that to my day, how distasteful that was. Can you imagine getting out of your nice warm bed and putting on wet clothes on, wet cold clothes, wet socks, wet underpants, wet pants, oh, I still remember that, yeah. Then of course you've got your leeches, uh, they, they would find you, they would um, yeah, they'd find any crevice anywhere to drop on you and crawl into and start, it used to like your groin, round the privates, oh yes, I love them, them bits, so... And you, you couldn't just pull them off, you had to burn them off or salt, put salt on because would, you'd leave the heads in and it would fester. So you'd uh, be there trying to get rid of these leeches and then stomp on them when he got rid of them. I didn't like them. Bull leeches were the worst. I only saw one chap with one on him and he fainted. He found this leech. It's about four inches long and it was filling up with his blood. And he, <laughs> he looked at it and, ah, and he fainted. <laughs> they got him round and got this bull leech off. But not nice. No. Any, anything else about the jungle? <laughs> so uh, you used to go out as a section, 10 men at a time and patrol. The thing was, when we first got out there, they asked the big lads to carry the brain gun, which is a light machine gun, weighs about 27 pounds with a magazine on. Then you've got the spare magazines. You've got a fair bit of weight compared to a jungle rifle, which is about seven, seven and a half pounds, very light. And... Uh, they found out the big chaps couldn't cope with it. They've got their own body weight plus all this weight and it was in the humid humidity. They was um, flaking out. So I picked the brain gun up off one chap who collapsed and carried on that that particular expedition. And they said, right, Paul, you're now a brain gun. <laughs> so I stuck with it. But luckily for me, it was it was a, a brilliant weapon, deadly man. If if you were the brain gun, you was... You was a kiddie, but also you was a target. If they wanted to ambush you, they'd try and shoot the brain gunners first because he was a dangerous one. But, yeah, that's how I finished up being a brain gunner. Well, it got this, it, they have a magazine of 30, but they only loaded it to 28 rounds because it over-tents it over, over the spring in the magazine. So 28 rounds per magazine. 
and you'd carry five or six magazines in straps around your body and um, one on ready to go. Um, but yeah, rapid fire. I mean, if you rapid fire, you could empty the magazine in about four seconds flat. So you didn't do that, but um, very accurate as well. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could really hit some bullseye with that. And I was a very good shot with it. I also learnt to talk myself to fire the brain from the shoulder. The rain it couldn't be done because it was too heavy. But I used to prime myself. All you did, you really picked it up in line of fire and fired a burst and then load it down again but you could do some damage in that time like yeah one one of these bandits had given communist terrorists to give himself up because he was a cook and uh, and he they threatened it unless he improved his cooking they were going to do him some harm so he gave himself up that was his story but if you gave yourself up you got a reward uh especially if you took them back to if they could trace them back to where the gang was in the jungle, which is what he did. And of course, they, we we came across him as the Lincolnshire Regiment, and uh, they they got us quick quickly together, and uh, we raced off out in lorries and up to up to this mountainous jungle where these CTs were. And uh, he he led us on to where they were. Like we knew there was by a waterfall, but <clears throat> we got the wrong one for a start, and then we found the second one. By then it was getting dark, so the officer said, well, we'll carry on, just take um, two or three brands with us and some weapons and uh, just a small patrol. And we'll get out as far as we can before it cause it gets dark about six o'clock in Malaya all the year round. And it was getting beginning to get dark, so we set off just some light rations and water bottle. And um, we kicked down on the jungle for that night not a not a pleasant thing because you get bitten and crawled and <laughs> leeches. Oh, it was not a nice night anyway. But we got up next morning and we went and we set off and sure enough we could hear this waterfall on there. They were having a breakfast and we sneaked down. The officer said, well, we can't. It was only sparsely. The jungle was a bit thin at that point. We'll go down. The officer picked me and this other brain gunner and himself and we went down very, very carefully, trying to, because there was a lot of noise with the waterfall, so we wouldn't have heard us. But if they'd looked up, they would have spotted us, and they were well armed. So we could have been in, because the other lads couldn't shoot at, at the bandits, because we was in the way. So it was down to us three, the officer and us two privates. And um, we went down, and he made his signal, me to fire, and he went to fire the left, fire the right, and so on. And uh, Sure enough, I, I aimed from the shoulder again and um, fired a full magazine and he opened up. The, retin the gunfire was heard about seven miles away. It was that loud. And, uh, yeah, we uh, two two got away, but they were wounded and we caught them later when the rest were dead. Um, and that was it, really. We we got them and, uh, and that's for that action the officer got the military cross. And the Sultan of the area heard about the officer getting the award and said, well, what did the other ranks get? And they said, I didn't get anything. So I said, oh, well, that's, that's not right. I want to give one of them a, a medal on behalf of uh, the Malayan uh, forces and so on. So um, pick your man and <laughs> pick me. I don't know why, but uh, I think it's. Been, I've been on guard duty the night before when he actually raped us all together. And he said, you could stay behind, pal, you've been on guard. I said, no, I want to I wanna go go along with the lads. So whether he took that in, in consideration, I don't know. But anyway, he picked me for it. And uh, we had to parade and do a special, because we weren't used to parading at that point. And I had to go and start learning how to parade again, go in front of the Sultan to be presented with his, his medal salute and all the rest of it. And that's how that came about. Letter from the Queen, giving me permission to wear it. We've moved in different places, about two or three moves in Malaya itself, where the regiment moved up further up north. We were down south for a start, and we moved up north, and that's where we stayed until I got demobbed. 
But yeah, we patrol from there. We just get them in lorries, drop us off at the jungle. Well, then of course we um, we had, we got uh, a little incident at the tin mines where uh, that we got rumours, some um, information that the communist terrorists were going to turn up at this tin mine to get food and supplies. So we set up ambush, ambush positions in what it was, it was the main jungle on this high mountain and down into the tin mines and a little hillock in between. So we set up ambush positions this side of the hillock away from the jungle so they couldn't be seen. And there we stayed. Well, I only got six weeks to do. So I was a little bit, um, you know, your mob happy, if that's the word. I took a book to read because half the time these people never turned up anyway. And um, I'd only took, in fact, that was quite funny. I, I went to get me, when we was getting ready to go, the officer was checking our equipment. He said, well, why have you got so many magazines, power? I said, well, I always take six. Well, you don't need six, he said. I said, well, don't book me. He said, three will be sufficient, which was uh, quite strange really afterwards when I thought about it. Anyway, so I took three, uh, three mags, and... Um, we had these low-powered binoculars. They weren't very good ones, but and this, we was looking at the tin miner's hut was about 600, 700 yards. Well, it's quite a good distance. And uh, we had a look up and suddenly they said, oh, there's a group of fellas down there. Looks like they've got long hair. I wonder if they've got anything to do with these communist terrorists. And so I don't know. There was only uh, four of us in that group, so it's, we sent the... The corporal and his, the other chap down with him to go over over the hill and down into the tin mine while I stood back and covered them like with a brain gun. And uh, as soon as they got over the top of the brow, there was a, a bandit sentry in the, in the jungle who spotted us coming over the top. And he opened up, he fired anyway, there was some bullets whistling about. And then this group started to scatter, so I opened up with a bring gun uh, <laughs> and it was set at 200 yards, so obviously it was too low. And I put tracer every so many rounds, put a tracer in so you could actually see where the line of fire was going. And I hit this water mains, high power water mains, <laughs> a big jet of water went up in the air. <laughs> and then, then I, I started to run down towards, and there was like an overhang where the iron ore and stuff went and they used to wash it. I fired a full, that was one full magazine gun um, uh, at this group. I understand we caught one or two of them, but they buried the body, so I can't confirm that. And then uh, I fired a full magazine into this machinery in case it was hiding this, this ramp over the sink. I understand it, thousands of pounds, <laughs> thousands of pounds of damage it shattered all this machinery. <laughs> I didn't give a damn anyway, I didn't know about it until later. And then I was down to one magazine. So I backtracked and I could see this one hiding in this little valley type thing before the big jungle and it was one of the boys. And so I fired from the shoulder and I get the full magazine. I'd obviously hit him because he dropped his weapon and there was blood stain, but they couldn't find the body. So he'd been wounded, he got away. But we understand through intelligence that they've... Villagers found him and buried the body, so we never could prove that we'd got him right. But it sounds like I got that one. Plus, I probably hit one or two others from this 700-yard range among this group because the brain can go a long way and go miles, you know, and still kill you. Um, so I don't know about that one, but uh, anyway. So after that, I was out of out of uh, round. So I started running towards the tin mine, and next thing I know, some bullet kept flying round me. And it was the officer uh, who'd seen me. He'd, he'd gone along the railway track thinking that if any terrorists had come along, they'd come along the track instead of from down the jungle. So he thought he'll pick the prime spot, get the glory. And they didn't come that way. So he had all this shooting going on. He raced up and he saw this figure with a brain gun running across thing. And he, he opened fire from, from the hip uh, and obviously missed me. Because he said, I'm oh, sorry, Powell. He said, I, I thought it was one of those CTs. And he said, luckily for you, I was firing from the hip. And I thought to myself at the time, if I'd have had more magazines and somebody had been shooting at me, I could have laid down, opened the tripods and decimated them. And so it's lucky I didn't have had more magazines because I might have shot the officer. <laughs> Can't make it up, could you? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. No, this officer, we had to strip and go for a medical. He said, no, you, you're the ideal bill for a boxer. I thought, no, I'm not doing it. I ain't got a nose for boxing. <laughs> so I wouldn't wear that one now. Out on patrol, and um, you've only got so much time, and you've got so much time to get back before it gets dark at six. It always gets dark at six. So once you're in the dark, you bollocks, you see, if you ain't got no camping gear with you, you keep down on the floor. So you allow yourself so much time to get back. And uh, we had the E-band tracker with us, and this corporal so I looked at his watch, it's time we went about tracking to get, get back again. Got his compass out and he said, right, on the compass bearing of so-and-so. And this, this tracker looked and he went, and he said, no, it's that way. I said, no. <laughs> we all said, I'll tell you what, we'll follow the E-band tracker and you do what you like. <laughs> sure enough, he follows us straight back to camp. God knows where we would have been if we followed him. <laughs> On a compass bearing, but you ain't got a clue, like uh, that was interesting, wasn't it? <laughs> if you ever got lost in the jungle, one chap did get it's funny, you could be in thick jungle following the chap in front of you, it'd be about five yards, and then the jungle would close in on him, and you'd go, but you'd get slightly off tangent and you'd be off in a different direction to him, so you'd be lost. And this, this is what happened to this chap, and anyway. He, he he went for so long he realised and he, he he started firing rounds off hoping they'd come and find him but they, they didn't they didn't find him in the end they found him up a tree that was it and he saved one round for himself in case they couldn't find him going to shoot himself but they did find him in the end he band track I must have tried, caught him but yeah funny place to be yeah you could soon get lost if you ever killed any enemies, uh, in this case the Malay Malayan terrorists, um, they had to be identified so we could see you, because they do they do a proper inquest afterwards. It's only like in a, a small room, but it's like a courtroom, and uh, they want to know who these people were and how they died and so on. So, uh, in order to um, do that, you are, I had to identify the corpses. So the, the usual way was to get their bodies back. But we was in mountainous terrain, and uh, the lads put the bodies on poles, but they just couldn't couldn't cope with it. It was too much <laughs> hard work carrying a, a, a body, especially over terrain like that. So um, the officer, I don't know whether he rang in about it or not, but he had to decide. And he was a vicar's son, so he was quite a, a sensitive person, really. And um, some of them they decided they were going to have to cut their heads off and their hands so they could take them back to be fingerprinted and photographed, which was against the Geneva Convention, as I understand it, but um, that's the only way we could prove what we'd done. So that's what we did. And they asked for volunteers to cut their heads off, which I was not going to be anything to no, no killing them, might chopping their heads off. Uh, so I, I, I didn't even want to watch it, but one of the chaps tried it and he couldn't do it. They got the E-band tracker in the end who was used to head hunting and he, he did the deed and uh, we, we put the, bond, the heads in the tarpaulins and hands and uh, we marched back uh, back to um, the road where the lorries picked us up. Band trackers, they're from um, Borneo and we keep them uh, if, you, if you get lost or they lose something. Uh, I mean, I lost a pack, uh, part of my pack off the back and the officer asked this tracker and we went back camped up and he went back and he traced it. God knows how we found it, but we found the pack. But half a mile in deep jungle, he found it and we brought it back again. But yeah, the regiment's gone now. It's been gone a few years, hasn't it? Amalgamated with the Anglians and then even the Anglians have gone, haven't they? And I think there was somebody else. I don't know what they are now. <clears throat> no idea. The army got smaller and smaller, didn't it? But um, they went a long way back, the Royal Lincolnshire Regiment, yeah. Fought some big battles in different wars, yeah. Yeah, it was a good crowd. I got interested in weightlifting by reading about it, and um, we had a, a sports fund, it was called, where they used to talk a shilling out, usually a pound or two pound a week, as it was then. Every now and so many weeks, you got stopped. This week, lads, I stopped the shilling for the sports fund. So I thought, right, I'll tap this. Never seen anything from the sports fund. I hadn't even got a football, I don't think, but 
I decided that um, I'd tap the sports fund. So I asked it, see the officer, and he asked me, in, what, what do you want? I said, well, I'd like to get some money from the sports fund to buy a set of weights. Weights, he said, what, what do you want weights for? I said, well, I'll do a bit of training. Yeah, I'm quite interested in it. And uh, <clears throat> I said, weightlifting, there's no such sport. That, that was his words from an officer. I said, well, it's in the Olympic Games, sir. Yeah, well, I've never heard of it, he said. I said, well, if I haven't heard of it, it doesn't exist. But anyway, he said, no, it's refused. Anyway, it's only you interested. So I thought, I'll go right round the camp and get them to sign a thing that they'll be interested in weightlifting. They wouldn't, but they'll put the name down. I went with the full list, still went by, still no, <laughs> didn't get it. So I had to save some money. Two or three of us lumped together and bought a set of weights from the Chinese and that used to make a little foundry, make some weights up, so we bought them there. And that's how I started, but um, it seems strange after all these years that this this weightlifting game, there's no such sport that uh, I've got where I've got. Yeah, self-taught, nobody to show me what to do, I just had to read about it and take it from there. But yeah, once we get demobbed, I, um, I went to Peterborough, as I say, um, on loan, and... Uh, trying to find a club and I went to, I went for a swim and I saw this chap with a good build on him. I thought he looks like he'd done a bit of weight weightlifting or weight training, so I'll have a word and sure enough he belonged to a local weightlifting club so he introduced me to that and um, I started training there in the in the few months that I was there and uh, I went to the uh, what was it? Arts, Arts County Championships, that's it, Arts, Arts, yeah, hmm. I decided to enter, had to join the British Amateur Weightlifting Association and uh, got the thing through and I, I put, you had to send your money off, you had to pay to join, to enter and uh, I won my first title um, at 10 stone, yeah, I, I was quite, quite chuffed with that. Well, uh, um, we moved from, um, moved to Scunthorpe, I, I, had to, I had a choice of going down to Hitchin which where I had stayed on the railway for a time, or uh, Scunthorpe. I'd been to a championships at Scunthorpe, so I knew they had a good weightlifting club there. So I decided to go to Scunthorpe, and that was in 1980, and joined the club there. And uh, we started having championships there, and we went from there, like, when I was uh, a fireman driver. Yeah. Yeah, passed my test. That was interesting, actually. He said, um, the inspect you have to pass, when you pass your... Um, all the exams, then you have to drive a, a passenger train, even though you've never driven one because it's all freight at Scunthorpe. But so um, I remember seeing the uh, the inspector. We went to Scunthorpe station and the Grimsby going to Grimsby Express drew in. And we stepped on the cab and the inspector said to the driver, oh, well, "Just have your seat, driver. This young man's taking his driving test." And so I sat, sat there and the, the driver said to me, have you driven there? I said, no, I'm all afraid. I said, well, I'll keep your arm. And he said, when I take shut off, I'll open up a bit and give her a bit more. Just do that. And he said, you'll be all right. And that's what happened. We, we went off at an airing pace, express, of course, going like the clappers and stopped at different places and drew into Grimsby Station. And he said, uh, oh, I'm pleased to sell him, Mr. Powell, you pass your driving test. I thought, oh, <laughs> that's something, isn't it? <laughs> What's my amazement? Yeah. The railways, as I say, they started they got starting to get rid of the diesel. And they, got, they got the diesel instead of the steam engines, which cut the overtime down tremendously. The wages dropped. And I put my notice in. The shed master wanted to see me while I was leaving. He said, you've passed your driving test now. You'll get be a regular driver in so many years. He said, you're turning a good career down to do what? I said, well, I'm going to the steelworks. God, man, he said, that, isn't that a bit of a mistake? I said, well, I can't really, I've got children then, I've got mouths to feed and I can't really afford it. So that's what happened. I gave me notes in and went in the steelworks. It was grinding, like these grinding machines that, um, uh, well, all sorts of steel, steel bars, slabs and things like that. And the gone rollers where the grinders, big grinders are, and there used to be heavy heavy weights put on the handlebars to, to give the the grinders some bite. And there was a spark, used to spark off and extract to take all the dust and so on. 
and that's when um, I was his slab, the, the crane driver used to pick these slabs off and take off, and he'd drop one or two and he'd bent one or two of the rollers slightly so there was jamming as you pushed, they used to jam. So um, this one started to jam and it stuck. So I got my um, feet behind it and gripped the edge of it, unfortunately, pushed it and it went and my finger in went with it. <laughs> so I lost my finger in. <laughs> Not a happy day, that. Wouldn't give in, but anyway. Yeah, that was it. Moved to Laos in um, 1980, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've been here from 1980. So moved up to 1980 and decided to uh, to move here and put some money into the the gym, which is a Chinese restaurant now. But we lived above it and had the gym downstairs, sauna and showers and so on. And uh, yeah, it went well. We um, Got invited to lift, uh, I won the British title, oh God, I'm trying to think when, where it was now, about 82, that was it, 1982, and got invited to lift in the World Championship in Australia, but that was going to be a dear do, but um, we put a request in the paper for funds, and this chap, who his, his wife used to come to the gym for sunbeds, and sometimes training, and uh, she saw me little notice on the thing asking for funds <coughs> she said to her husband um, would you like to give him he said yeah I'll give him something so she said um, I think we've got something for you when you, next time I come and she got a check for 500 pounds well it was going to be about 800 I think 8 or 900 for Australia and all the gummies that goes with it and uh, she came back a few weeks later and said um, have you um, got enough I said well I'm, I'm, I'm about 200 short but I'll, I'll get there <laughs> the next week she turned up with a cheque for 200 so that chap paid for it but um, luckily enough I um, I got a, I got a bronze bronze medal that first one and took it to show him some flowers and a thank you for them and he said oh, if you get a chance to go again we'll see about back in you and of course from then on I went and got um different places around the world and got um, eight, eight goals, that's it. Eight goals and one bronze, yeah. Oh, this is the uh, 60 kilo class, nine stone six. That's the body weight I lifted up. I usually had to lose a bit of weight to get down to that, but that's what we did. I used to sour myself and dehydrate and all the rest of it. And it was quite funny, really. Training most days, alternate days, heavy, light and so on and that sort of thing. I experimented with it, not having a coach, but um, going from past experience and um, we seem to get the right formula, which was the main thing, wasn't it? It's just the three lifts, deadlift, bench press and squat. Yeah, so I'd, I'd sort of deadlift and bench press one day and squat the next and, and, and alternate that way. And um, But... You can overdo it if you're not careful, but I, I, I monitored it carefully and it seemed to work anyway. We went there and you know, a day or two off one before you lift it and you go for it. And I so say that's when uh, the big one, of course, when we beat Precious McKenzie. I was in, it was in uh, Sydney, Australia, and we was told we going to be lifting against Precious McKenzie. I thought, oh God, very rarely been beaten and that, that was me against him. And nobody else, because I think all the rest had dropped out when they found out he was lifting and... Uh, that was the battle we had, and uh, luckily for me, um, I outsquatted him by 10 kilos. I did a 185 kilos, and he did a 175 and missed his 185. Then we bench pressed, he did 120 for a new world, this is all kilos, 120 for a new world record. I did 100, so it was level pegging at the deadlift, and the deadlift came in and... Uh, that was my forte, that's the one I'd really trained on. And um, I needed the last deadlift at four, 230 kilos. Um, he'd, he'd failed his last one, so I had to do this 230 to beat him by two and a half kilograms on the total. It's the total that wins, not the individual lifts. The three lifts added together, it's the total that wins. And I was two and a half, if I missed this two, 230, I was level pegging with him, but he was the lighter man who would win, so I had to do this 230, which you saw on the telly. 
Uh, nine stone six, you're nearly four times body weight. It's, it's getting heavy. Yeah. Getting heavy. But we did it. We did it. Yeah. I, I was weighing in about ten. I'd be nine stone six. So I was weighing in about ten one, ten two normally. So I had to lose about six pounds. The only way I could do that, I found, is by cutting back on food generally and dehydrating at the last few days. So I jump. I could found I could jump in a hot bath and and sweat and wrap myself in towels and keep sweating. I could lose maybe a pound, sometimes two pound that way. But then you couldn't have a drink, you see, because you put it back on again. So that was quite agonising, but we, we did it. We did it in the end. And uh, and then you have to control it until you get there, until you weighed in. Then you can get some liquid down you. But, yeah, it was, it was hard work, but we did it. It's willpower, really. Not eating and not drinking, especially not drinking. You'd be surprised when you can't drink how much you want to drink. <laughs> People that's never done it don't understand, do they? It really, like cutting you down on food, isn't it? Having very little food because you've got to get your eat down below a certain weight. Um, they don't understand, but no reason to, is there? But it's quite, it's quite a, an effort in discipline. Yeah, I found it anyway. Well, you just say you either do this or you don't lift. Simple as that. And if it's the World Championships, you've been invited, you've raised the money to go. You can't let people down there for the sake of losing a few pounds, even though it's hard work. So you go for it. I have a strong, strong will that way. Yeah. I've never been a smoker. I, um, my mum was a heavy smoker and um, she was a diabetic as well, which didn't help. But I think it was the smoking that got her in the end. She had a really bad cough. And I used to say to mum, pack, pack them cigarettes and you used to go, <coughs> it's me only... <coughs> pleasure I thought oh god I always remember that yeah um and it got her in the end she died about just over 60 so she was not not a, a good age at all uh so I never smoked I, I had one I lit one up my friend fam, family friend or something was smoking his own and it was rough cut Bruno which is quite strong I think in the I don't know but he rolled me one and I said make it a second so it lasts because I was greedy you see Boy, did it last. My mum said I actually turned green. She'd never seen anybody green before, but I was vomiting and it really hit me. I thought, wow, if that's smoking, forget it. And that was it. Never smoked since. And uh, drinking, I found out that um, I've only been drunk about twice in my life. Been quite ill with it. So I seem to react to things like that more than most. So I'm, I'm not, I, I can drink, I have a pint or half a pint, you know, enjoy it if I'm thirsty, but I'm not, I'm not bothered. Whether that's stood me in good stead over the years, I don't know, but it seems to have done anyway. I think you've got to persevere and don't get, expect results too fast. People expect them, it's like bodybuilders, you know, they, if they don't look like Mr. Universe in six weeks, they pack it in. But now, weightlifting, powerlifting, it's a, it's a long-term thing. And you build up gradually, bit by bit, and maintain it as best you can. The older you get, of course, the weaker you get. Past um, 60 or 70, it starts to fade. You lose about 20% of your strength at 60, I understand. And I don't know what it is after that, but it's progressive anyway. No matter how hard you train, your strength still drops. It's just the, lot of the way it goes, isn't it? <laughs> you, you, you're running out of whatever... <laughs> Oh, my stubborn sod. <laughs> um, just a challenge, really. And in the end of the day, it's uh, old father times that's a challenge. You're going to get weaker, you're going to get old, and you're going to die. So how much can you keep going on and, uh, and for? And can you still go into championships and maybe, against your own age group, still win? Um, that, that's partly it. So I've got a, quite a competitive streak with me, really, I think. <laughs> Fitness is a relative term, isn't it? But yeah, not bad for me age, I suppose, considering. Just while I get my teeth into something and I'm doing well at it, I'll persevere with it. <clears throat> then the challenge comes at the end of it as you're losing your strength. Do you call it a day and pack it in, or do you continue and see what happens? And that's more or less that's me, I suppose. 
me and my young man. Now I'm still doing a little bit. <laughs>